Hey everybody, you are listening to Incorruptible Massachusetts. Um, we are here to uh, help folks understand about state politics. So we talk a lot about um, why it is so broken, what we could have here in Massachusetts if we fixed it and uh, how you can get involved. So um, I'm excited as always to introduce uh, my co-hosts. We will start off with, um, well, let's go with Jonathan Cohn first today. Yeah, uh, Jonathan Cohn, he, him, his, joining from Boston after an issue and a progressive issue and electoral work here in Massachusetts. And happy to be here as always. And Jordan Bird Powers. Uh, my name is Jordan Bird Powers. I use he, him. I'm involved in electoral politics across Massachusetts. I'm here in, Mass in Worcester. And uh, yeah, um, I think that's it. <laughs> Glad to be here. <laughs> we could always say more. Anna Callahan, she, her, <laughs> coming at you from Medford. Um, and uh, always excited to talk about the state house um, and to talk about having having a life, having a wonderful, amazing life, which we really could have here in Massachusetts. So today we're going to talk about a whole lot of amazing policies that were in the state house that could have passed until very recently, and now they have no chance of ever passing this entire term. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn to uh, Jonathan. And Jonathan, can you explain to us what just happened? Yeah, so just a few weeks ago at the very beginning of February uh, was what's called in the state house and have like those around it as quote, joint rule 10 day. So joint rule 10 in the jo joint meaning house senate rules that that day is a reporting deadline for any bills in a joint committee. So that means that they, they need to do something. That can mean kind of giving it a favorable report, sending it out to another committee. Uh, that can mean giving it an adverse report. That can mean choosing to give it an extension of saying like, uh, even though I created this deadline for myself, I don't wanna actually adhere to it. Maybe for good reasons, maybe not. Uh, and then, uh, and then what happens with many bills is sending it to study, which is a polite way of killing a bill, because for whatever reason, they always hate voting down each other's bills. So they just send them to study, bundling large numbers of bills together in the same order um, of creating a study order, which like if, the, if, if our committees were actually going to spend time studying all of these bills so that they can come better prepared next session, that would be one thing. What it actually means, it, as I often say. <laughs> <laughs> if only. Right? If only that's what the committees are planning to do. Um, instead, I have often described it as it basically just means that the bills have died and like, like a phoenix, they will rise from the ashes and be refiled at the start of the next session session um but for the rest of the session their life is over life is over and and you know what a great explanation that's that's so down to earth um just i probably nobody listening to this needs to hear this but like we our particular state house works on a a calendar mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. every bill that that is that has any chance of passing has to get submitted in the first couple of months of the ter of the two-year term mm -hmm. and then every bill goes through a committee and, and, it, and it can't move forward unless it comes out of that committee favorably. Mm -hmm. So this whole and, joint day 10, joint rule day, rule 10 day, blah, 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 I can't even say it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and then a, a few quick things to tag in there. One, what's kind of ironic about it is that it's a fairly quote unquote recent creation mm -hmm. um, of I think like m m early mid 2010s, I think. And it was done as a way of getting them to do things faster as opposed to only in the last days of the legislative session. Uh, um, and fortunately it worked because they do, they, they pass so many bills <laughs> early. Uh, no, uh, like it, it just leads to them ex giving extensions to everything. So, so it goes, um, and then I was gonna make one other point. Also one thing that we see with, with that deadline as well coming up is if folks remember the House and Senate never actually agreed on a set of joint rules at the start of the session. Of this session. Of this session. <sighs> so if you remember kind of way back when, when there was the whole debates around, um, particularly around with around roll call votes being made, committee roll call votes being published, oh, yeah. where the Senate was like, sure, why would we oppose that? And the House, House was like, what if we only tell you who votes against 
against something uh, as, as though that's, that, that is uniquely useful as opposed to the whole thing, as well as debates about whether to treat te committee testimony as a public record with appropriate redactions for privacy, et cetera. They just rather than, or, or even I think a, a disagreement about how much notice people should get around hearings. There was a conference committee created to find a consensus set of rules. It is unclear if that committee ever met. They did not <laughs> produce anything. And so they are just on autopilot with the rules from last session. Oh. So that means that, so there was an article, I think, from the State House News Service about one bill being sent to study and how, like, yeah, we have to kind of call around to see how people voted. And it was from the Judiciary Committee, and Jamie Eldridge was like, sure, this are how the people voted on our side. And Mike Day, says, I will tell you who is the House chair was, I will tell you who voted no. <laughs> so here we are, and we have just passed the once every two years moment when a bunch of bills could have gone on, but instead yeah. they were all killed until next session. Mm -hmm. So we can add these to the list of bills that the state house has sat on for years and years and years and years and years and years and years. Um, so ooh, we got a giant list here. I'm so excited about some of these. Um, Jordan, do you want to jump in and uh, talk about either just generally or just jump in with um, one of the bills that well, we are <coughs> we're horrified, <laughs> excited, I'm excited to talk about, but horrified <laughs> these no-brainer bills cannot move forward. Uh, well, let's talk, let's talk about the one that's most, I think, interesting to, to I mean, most poignant, I guess, right now um, is so the ICC, so the, the, you know, there was a report that basically said that we have an ever shortening window to mm -hmm. stave off the worst parts of climate change. We are in climate change. So to be clear, you know, we are already having the effects of climate change. If you think the weather is weird now, um, know that this is the most normal it will ever be in your lifetime if we don't do something. If you were like, wow, last summer was hot, that is the coldest summer you mm -hmm. will experience in your lifetime if we don't do something. So and the drought on the a, West Coast, it's like a 1200 year drought on the West Coast right now, right? right? That, we have not a had a drought like that in 1200 years and it's not. But guess what? That's, that's going to be the most wet it will be. <laughs> that, that'll be the most precipitation that this West gets in our lifetime if we don't do something. So there's a bill to make 100% renewables move forward a stronger date, maybe take some real action on climate change that got killed because of course. <laughs> and I think what's especially, I think if there was a bill from like Erica Eiderhoven and Jamie Eldridge was like, okay, let's look, the IPCC is going like five alarm, like five alarm fire. Why don't we say like that mass set like the most aggressive timeline that Massachusetts can, because we don't like we in an affluent state in an affluent country have have everything we need to take action now. Absolutely, yep. and our, our entire populace. I mean, it's the number one issue for so many people. Really, really important. Um, I'm going to jump in with some some voting rights stuff. I mean, we're all everybody's concerned about democracy. Everybody is concerned about people's voting rights. And people do not understand that that is not just a problem in Southern states, right? We got a huge problem here. And there were some great bills that would allow um, for a lot of uh, voting rights to happen, including um, municipalities to be able, duly elected representatives in cities to be able to make decisions that allow people to vote. How can, how can we, how is the state we said it before, the state is like protecting the wealthy from democracy, right? And here's one of the ways. They uh, are not going to allow, they're not going to move forward on potentially allowing city governments to um, allow people who are 16 years old to vote, to allow non-citizens to vote, to allow municipalities to have ranked choice voting. So all sorts of ways in which we are duly elected representatives cannot bring more voting rights to our cities. And what, what's, what's so wild to me about that is that it, it has this kind of unpleasant patrician quality to it of the legislature saying, oh no, 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 we know better than like the municipalities, especially when it comes to um, stuff like vote 16, uh, allowing 16 year olds to vote in local elections, 17 year olds, or allowing non-citizens to vote in local elections, when municipalities have sent home rule petitions to the state legislators, uh, legislature over the years, 
the, the legislature has sat on. And all they're asking for is like, can't you just pass something so we don't have to bother you if we want to do this? And, and they continue to say no. Yeah. When it doesn't even affect their elections. It's just yeah. their local I, elections. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> And so, you know, there's a lot of, and just to, on that, on that part of it, you know, so the public, the public records law, uh. Uh, <laughs> the law to we gotta, ensure, yeah, we got to talk about this one, to ensure that the public records be applied to the governor's office and to our other state elected officials. We are one of, only, I think we're one, we're the only state or maybe one of, there's only one other state. I think we're the only state that has it for governor, uh, legislature, and judiciary all fully exempt. All three all branches fully? of our state government are exempt from public records law. You cannot do a FOIA request to get information on what they do up there. You can't get that information, period. You're not allowed. So, so think about, for those of you who are trying to like wrap your minds around this, a lot <laughs> of what we know that the Trump administration did was through, mm -hmm. through the access of citizens being able to see what their government is doing. So the thing, so when we're like, oh, you know, people are like Trump's corrupt and here's the proof, that proof <laughs> comes from public records, right? Those are records that belong to us because it's on our dime, our, our time, our money and our houses. We all, you know, they are democracy, they are our houses, right? They have to, they have to let that be known to the public what they're doing. And our state is like, no, you cannot know. And it's just something that's wild that it's like, that it's just like at their discretion, whether or not they should give them. Um, when it's not, when, when legislators often complain about that, that like, oh, but we have so many important private discussions, which aren't even, uh, which like you would just say deliberative process, you would get an exemption, the law wouldn't even apply. They just don't want to even give like an agenda or like yeah. employment records, I think. But thinking, um, one other thing to kind of, oh yeah, Jordan, you want to tag in on the legislature? Yeah, well, just like in terms of the legislature needing public records, the other part to that is that that place is a toxic workplace uh -huh. where people know that other legislators are, are there's harassment, right? That how legislators are openly harassing um, young, uh, women who go, it's not young, it's all women who go into the state house face some form of harassment when they're in the state house. And that is, a, you know, I don't know, we just sort of allow that to happen. This, but like you walk in and it's the 1950s on TV, it's just like a weird thing. And that could be accessed through the again, public records and other things. But there is a bill to also, uh, to also look into the legislature's handling of yeah. um, to, to create clear um, avenues to both look into and mm -hmm. hold legislators and staff accountable for harassment. And they can't do that, they can't clean up their own workplace. But they are was, willing to lock up other people, which I think is another <laughs> piece of things. You know, other people do minor things. They're all for it. Yeah. <laughs> to be clear, up. to be clear, that harassment one is another one that died on uh, Joy Rule Day yeah. 10, right? The, the Rule 10. I still can't say that. <laughs> Joy Rule 10. <laughs> so that one, the harassment one also died that day. I will really hear I'll, yeah. Anna, I'll see you. But clearly our legislature voted to advance banning tear gas. Uh, <laughs> I want to talk about this one because like we literally had during a pandemic the largest protest in what the history of America? The largest, most prolonged protest in a hundred years, maybe. I mean, it was freaking ginormous and really demands a number of demands around uh, George Floyd's murder um, and uh, you know, police brutality. And you know, some of the demands are things like, hey, why don't we not allow our police departments to get, you know, to either pay for or get free military equipment like tanks um, and uh, you know, machine guns and other things that they obtain to turn them into like an, a mil, an army against us. Um, and that, <laughs> that and the tear gas, the military equipment and the tear gas, which are no brainers, mm -hmm. they died too. I think also important is that they, you know, not just that, but they also killed um, right. So at the same time, there was an attempt to eliminate mandatory minimums for drug offenses. So I just want to be clear 
that our legislature not only kills cleaning up sexual harassment at its own place, it also will not say that drug that that um, that drug use, right, which is an addictive process, that that should that we shouldn't put lock people up for that, and we certainly shouldn't keep people locked up or have people locked up for drug offenses we no longer think are a problem. <laughs> We've legalized, uh. right? So we could eliminate mandatory minimums for drug offenses. We could have, there were bills, there was a, there was a bill to clean people's pasts, right? All of those mm-hmm. things died. Um, just to give you an idea of the sort of like, to, you know, things that should have happened but didn't happen. And what, what's wild about that with mandatory minimums, especially is how like back in 2018, when they had their big criminal justice reform bill and they cleaned some, but they also created new mandatory minimums. So right. like, it would have been nice to not have to still be discussing that <laughs> if only they had actually included that. In terms of things that they run out the clock on, just thinking of uh, stuff addressing kind of incarceration, back in the beginning of the, of the pandemic, there was a bill filed to address the kind of the terrible state of COVID in, pr- in prisons and jails. Because when you think about what are some of the worst possible environments for the spread of a pandemic, and you probably could not design a better place for that than a prison or jail. And so you know, the bill to help to basically address that, to kind of go through to see who should be released, like kind of actually putting some teeth into some things that occasionally happen voluntarily. And the legislature will have gone the entire pandemic, since the bill's now dead for the session. And um, fingers crossed, we are fingers not crossed. still in the pandemic at the start of the next legislative session. Um, we'll go on the whole pandemic without having actually passed that. They passed like minor things connected to that in the past, but just like have not done the bill itself. Yeah, and they and um, just to continue on ways that they fail their criminal justice system, they've also failed you know treatment versus incarceration on opioids. So something mm-hmm. again, we all agree on. There's not like, there's not debate. People are like people who are addicted because of the ways in which we've pushed opioids into the main place. We understand the Sacklers are a problem. We have all collectively agreed, right? That's probably Mm -hmm. universal belief. And yet here's a bill to try to correct some of those problems. And we can't get that out of our legislature, our democratic legislature. Um, And then thinking about again, healthcare, uh, you know, there's this, there's some more, there's healthcare bills that again mm-hmm. are <laughs> in some form of, um, some form of, of like, you know, we should be doing more and we're, we're not doing enough. So the legislature killed bills around full spectrum pregnancy care. Mm-hmm. And like, that's, you know, you might want to deal with that considering what we all know the Supreme Court's about to do oh, yeah. on Roe v. Wade. And yet here mm-hmm. again, the legislature fails the moment, fails the moment to step Absolutely. up and set some clear guidelines. You know, they did some good things with the Roe Act in, in, um, in, uh, that they passed, uh, but here is a chance to do more to meet mm-hmm. this moment. And again, it's just sort of dies in the rule 10. Especially because like kind of on that point that, that, that's so important is that we're often trying to number of rights, but still considering that the legislature didn't want to address the barriers that are like unique to low income kind of women and other kind of pregnant individuals, like that, like you still face those barriers still exist. But that if you can't afford something, if you can't afford, if you can't afford a right, you do not have that right. 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 Welcome to America. <laughs> oh. Yeah. And so just to, and then on top of that, one of the things that sort of overlaps that, that's interesting. And I didn't actually know about this until um, my city, Worcester, lost one of its best staff members because our, because city officials across the state of Massachusetts don't have paid leave. Mm -hmm. You know, they are exempted from the law that we passed Mm -hmm. and we could be requiring, again, this is an important thing. They should have the same rights that now we have, right? Like, so the Mm -hmm. right, so people who are not public officials in, um, in our municipality, so our city government have the ability to take time off, paid leave, sick time, and also paid leave for their families. We lost a staff member in Worcester because she, um, the staff member had individual um, sick time, but their kid needed to go to the to the doctor. They had regular health needs that needed consistent 
visits to the doctor and they didn't have time off for that. They were using vacation days for doctor's visits for their kid and the city didn't have in its contract, it didn't pass in its law. The city of Worcester paid leave to care for everybody, to pay, care for your to family. And so this is again, the way the legislature is failing to take care of people. And this is a no brainer, right? You're just aligning municipalities with the law, <laughs> with, the, yeah. with the law that's applied to everyone. Yeah, and, and, and to take that like a little bit sort of bigger picture in terms of how, um, how our entire relationship between employers and employees mm -hmm. um, is affected. You know, in Massachusetts, we are an at-will employment state. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. means that any company can fire you for any reason. They don't have to have a reason, no reason mm -hmm. at all. They give it two weeks, you're gone. That mm -hmm. just opens up so much, you know, chance for abuse in terms of people trying to organize their union, in terms of people, mm -hmm. you know, needing to take to take time for to care for their kids. There's so many reasons it, you do for everything from the racism and sexism to like, like you could be fired for anything because they don't have to even say why. That's an at will state. And this is another one that did not, that like it's not going to be addressed. Um, it's not going to get passed. Um, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of open this up for last call here with every single thing that we've been talking about. And we basically just we yeah. looked through like what are some of the obvious no-brainers of things that they killed at the state house um, that really should have gone on. Um, so if you so there's more, there's tons more, but every single thing we've talked about today is something that they should have passed and that they have killed for yet another session. Um, and so and yeah, Jonathan. Yeah, one thing I'll tag in as the final one that's just embarrassing that we don't do yet in Massachusetts. So like there have been, there's been progress on immigrants' rights in the state house, but the house having recently passed the driver's license bill, so that immigration status is not a barrier to getting a driver's license. But one thing that's been just frozen in the legislature for, for like well over a decade now is just giving undocumented residents of Massachusetts access to in-state tuition. So it's not even not even making everything free for everybody, which we should do, but just saying the lower rates that you pay if you're a citizen who from Massachusetts should also apply if you are a non-citizen who lives in Massachusetts. Doesn't this isn't this already the law in like Texas and some of these other like there are places that we do not think of as very progressive places that already do this? Yeah, no, it, yes. it's I, I can. I, I think tech, like it sounds familiar to me that that Texas has it. Let me pull that up really quickly. Um, yeah, Texas, uh, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Florida, Illinois, Kansas, Maryland, Minnesota, Nebraska, New Jersey, uh, New Mexico, New York, Oklahoma, Oregon, Texas, Oklahoma. Utah, Washington, <laughs> and Wisconsin. Unfortunately. Massachusetts is just not as progressive as, I, unfortunately, we're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> and I, I like well yeah, yeah. I just think, I think it's good also just to wrap all this up to, to remind people because one of the things the legislatures love to come back to us is just how and the, you know, they will remind us of the ways in which they continue to pass at the edges. They continue to do small mm -hmm. things. And I think it's important because, you know, legislating doesn't need to be difficult. They could easily pass every single thing we just listed. They are ridiculously popular. They are not controversial. And they could easily pass them, right? Like these are, you know, the majority of these things would be five minute conversations. Legislating does not have to be an anathema to our legislature. They could do the minimum things they're doing right now Right? Like you could do a driver's license bill and in-state tuition and also make it easier to vote, right? Like those are not difficult things for a legislature to do. But our legislature barely manages to pass one bill of substance and a budget. That's basically it. It's embarrassing. And they make it sound like it's a lot. Mm -hmm. They make it sound like it's a lot. It is. I just want to be clear for everybody. It is not. <laughs> you could be doing all of these things relatively easily. That's right. A little tiny comment because we've mentioned it a number of times the driver's license bill. I don't want people to get the wrong impression. That bill no. is not the law yet. No. There's movement no. forward. Okay, it sounds like, because we've been talking, it's like, oh, they've done this thing. 
Okay, yeah. that bill is not <laughs> guaranteed. It has been there for 17 years and it yeah. has managed to get out of committee. Wow. <laughs> so let's well, it got, it got, it, it, got it, it passed the house. It did pass okay. the house. Passed the house. So, yeah. It, it, is, the it house. is on the path. Yeah, but like to give an action step to people listening, it does still need to pass the Senate. So you should make sure that your senator is going to vote vote for yeah. it. Yeah. Yes. Since yeah, exactly. the Senate should have the votes, they will need likely need the votes to override our governor, uh, which they should also have, but they need to do it and they should do it faster. Yeah. And then my tiny final thing is um, we neglected to mention public financing of elections, which is a big thing for me. Like I'm, I'm a public financing of elections girl and it passed by the way in the, the late nineties it became the law of the land. And then the state legislature, and I believe the state house specifically decided not to fund it. And mm -hmm. therefore it could not be implemented even though like, they found a way to not do democracy. You know, congratulations. <laughs> um, and this time around, here we are 20 years later, still not moving it forward. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Oh my goodness. Uh, such a pleasure to be here with you guys, able to be outraged together <laughs> <laughs> and to um, laugh so that we don't cry because <laughs> that's where we are. We laugh a lot on this show, but only because, you know, we, we, we You'd cry all day. Yeah, we, we <laughs> you know, we're optimists. We believe that we, we're going to make change here. Um, and, uh, and we're happy to be doing it together and happy with all of you out there listening. So thanks everybody. We will see you next week.